How will coronavirus impact this brand? Joining us on Inside Government is Jaswinda Bedi. He's the chief person of Kenya Export Promotion and Branding Agency. He's now joining us to discuss this and more. Thank you so very much indeed, Jess, for your time. Thank you for having me. Uh, I mean, when you look back at, um, you know, our branding journey, you know, since Brand Kenya Board was formed in 2008, uh, what conclusions do you draw? Well, I think we've come a long way. Uh, today, the Brand Kenya is recognized globally. We have some great uh, initiatives. We've got uh, uh, some of our, uh, our jewels, crown jewels, as I would call it, is our runners. And if you look at our runners, uh, every time you go out there in New York Marathon or London Marathon, you see one, two, three. I mean, right up there will be Kenya. But uh, do we have a running apparel, for example? You know, Nike's got a brand, but do we have a Kenya brand? Because if we're going to wear, if Kenyans are going to be winners, then surely they should associate the brand to that running event. So I think we've come a long way. We're thinking in that direction. And uh, the sole mandate right now for the Kenya Export Promotion and Branding Agency, uh, very simple mission statement is brand Kenya, export Kenya, uh, and uh, build Kenya. The three. All three, yeah. And, uh, you know, we'll be coming back to you. We'll be touching on the issues of, um, you know, export, pro export promotion. But, but, but still on the brand, you cannot sell a brand that you do not believe in. You cannot sell a brand that you have not bought yourself. Do you believe that Kenyans have bought brand Kenya? Well, you see, the thing is, we've got a stigma, all of us, as consumers, that uh, what is made in Kenya may not be adequate in terms of quality or price or uh, fashion or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But that is changing. We're seeing more and more people wanting to wear uh, the Kenyan brand, more and more people with the Friday dress down wanting to wear a local uh, clothing to associate themselves with the local brand. And we're seeing more and more of that. And uh, if you look at our new logo, you can see there are 47 dots on that logo. And those 47 dots represent 47 counties. And we're taking it a step further with our new ERP system, which we're going to be launching later this year. We're going to have Wanjiku in uh, Nyandarwa will have her own email address and she wants to export uh, avocados. She will be taken to the marketplace. So there's a lot of work that's been done in the background. And uh, yes, I agree with you, uh, it's not over. And branding is a constant exercise. It's an exercise that keep reminding your consumers and your constituents. And of course, in this case, we're not only branding Kenya abroad, we're also branding Kenya within. Mm -hmm. So the exercise needs to start at home. When home ground is fully uh, secure that, yes, we are a national brand and we can then move into a global brand. Mm -hmm. So I think the journey is going to be a little bit reverse. First, brand yourself nationally and then take yourself to the international scene and then brand yourself globally. Mm -hmm. And it's proper that you have brought that issue, you know, first of all, branding Kenya for Kenyans themselves. Because critics of brand Kenya before, you know, are of the fact that, um, you know, the country branded itself for foreigners to the international community. But we forgot that in Kenya, they are Kenyans. And we have not sold the brand Kenya, you know, to Kenyans. No, I absolutely agree. I mean, we are 50 million Kenyans. And I think we are all very, very proud in the sense that, yes, like I said, running is a classical example. You talk about uh, running, and you know the marathons are going to be, Kenya is going to be right up there. So we have so many, I would call them heroes, that a wall of fame can be put up there. And in that wall of fame, I mean, Mashu Jade is a classic example where we need to recognize these heroes and recognize what Kenyans have done for Kenya. And, and that is now moving in a motion that it will be. And you saw His Excellency the President uh, in uh, June 1st on his speech of Madraka Day. He recognized 68 Kenyans in the fight against COVID. I mean, normally that happens only once a year around Jamhuri Day. But this was, it was uh, not normal when you're given awards midway through a year. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to tell Kenyans at large that yes, we recognize the hard work you're doing. And yes, you've done a fantastic job. And yes, Kenya has done well. We didn't ro lock down our economy in its entirety compared to other countries who are now pulling up and finding it extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. So I see that there is a, a, a new pride, let's put it this way, mm -hmm. on the brand. And uh, I mean, when you do a sort of analysis on this brand that we are calling Kenya, yeah. I mean, what would you highlight as significant challenges you know, that face this brand? And what are the opportunities? 
Well, you know, to me, with every challenge comes an opportunity. So I don't even look at uh, the challenges as challenges. I look at them as opportunities. How do you address them? So within every challenge is the opportunity. So if we feel that we're not uh, branded ourselves well, and it, if Kenya has not projected an image of that brand, then really speaking, what can we do differently and what should we do differently? Mm -hmm. So I see that uh, right now there is that pride. And if you can see, even with there's a strong Buy Kenya, Build Kenya initiative that's government in initiated. And we are noticing that more and more in supermarkets where they're saying made in Kenya. We're seeing that and we're trying to shelf and position ourselves that you know what? Yes, there is a choice. The consumer can buy local, can buy imported. but there should be a new pride in buying local because you're creating local jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, and really that's what it is. How does a country evolve and how do you create consumerism into, into an economy? Is when you have a pride of a national brand. I saw a video that's been flying around on social media, I don't know if you've seen it, whereas uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of uh, the UK, said, UK is nothing without Kenya. I mean, that's a fantastic statement. Mm -hmm. And that needs to go out there in the media to say yes. Why did he say that? He actually said for, for the last uh, 100 years they've been drinking Kenyan tea. But the truth of the matter is we all drink English breakfast tea. But there's not a single bush in England <laughs> for tea. It's Kenyan tea. Yeah. But we haven't branded it right. Mm -hmm. So what's wrong with having the Kenyan breakfast tea? Nothing wrong, right? But is that stigma? Is that uh, marketing? Is that push? And all this tea, I mean, it's packaged in Dubai, but it's Kenyan tea. And I think the paradigm that we want to shift now is much stronger than we think. I'll give you an example. If you look at Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka exports uh, 300 million kilos of tea. And black tea. Yeah, uh, black tea. And they, their export revenue is uh, $3.5 billion. Kenya exports 400 million kilos of black tea. And our export revenue is $1.4 billion. So the total disconnect, we export 25% more but our revenue base is like 40% uh, of uh, Sri Lanka. So what have they done right and what have we done wrong? Mm -hmm. I mean, their story is to be told. The truth of the matter is Sri Lankan tea got branded into a space and uh, got its premium value. And whereas Kenyan tea just remained Majani Chai and it just sold in the auction. We haven't done any value addition. Yes, we haven't done any value addition. And what it's used for, it, I, was I went to Sri Lanka to talk to the tea players that why don't you come and invest in Kenya? And uh, they said, you know, Kenyan tea is super important for English breakfast tea. And I said, uh, what do you mean? And uh, he said, well, English breakfast tea is a recipe of three regions, which I didn't know. So I learned as well. And I said, what are the three regions? He said the British used to rule East Africa and India and Sri Lanka and all that. So the recipe for English breakfast tea is one kilo Assam, which is from India, one kilo Colombo, which is Sri Lanka, and one kilo Kenya. And that to date remained the recipe. And I said, so why do you need the Kenyan tea? Why can't you just make your own tea? Mm -hmm. He said the aroma and the color that comes from Kenyan tea is what defines English breakfast tea. So we have a value proposition that we are not capturing. And that value proposition, mm -hmm. if we can capture it and project ourselves, our $1.4 billion uh, tea can very quickly move, move to $7 billion. Mm -hmm. But we need to have a whole story on the value addition, the packaging, the marketing, and uh, so there is huge opportunities in Kenya if we just move the needle and go into value addition. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, and this is the narrative that we have been trying to create in the, tw in the last 12 years. And for example, you know, when you talk Germany, what comes into mind is technology. You know, when you talk about Japan, it comes to electronics um, and uh, automobiles. When you talk about the new the USA, what comes into mind is Hollywood, you know, and shiny uh, concrete uh, structures. But what kind of a narrative do we want to create around Kenya? Well, you see, traditionally, when you talk Kenya, what comes in mind is safari. People don't even think that we have a manufacturing facility, or we have any factories. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, safari is strong, and uh, our uh, safaris are brilliant, and we see people paying a ton of cash to come here as tourists in, uh, you know, during the migration and all that when they go and visit Masai Mara. So that is true. But besides safari, I mean, it's a great uh, uh, thing to be the safari country of the world. But there are other things that we manufacture. There are other things that we produce. But it's not known to the world out there. 
So, and if you look at a, a contribution, I mean, a manufacturing contribution to a GDP is about 8%. The government's view is we very quickly we want to take it to 15% under the Big Four agenda. Mm -hmm. And that needs to happen. The size of the pie today is about $90 billion. That's our GDP. And uh, if you look at, uh, and you talk to critics and they say, oh, but manufacturing industry has been collapsing. It used to be 12%, now it's 8% of GDP. But the fundamental question is, it was 12% when our GDP was 45 billion. It's 8% when the GDP is 90 billion. So in sheer size, today's number is bigger in dollar revenue terms than the percentage. But yes, yeah, services have grown and other sectors have also grown. Uh, tourism has grown. But I think what we need to do is uh, we need to make sure that we're not branded the safari country. We are branded, yes, safari is part of the experience of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And yes, when you go to Kenya, there's no country in the world or no capital city in the world where you have a national park. I mean, the images that you see sometimes with a lion and Kenyatta Conference Center in the background from Nairobi National Park. But absolutely, I mean, there is no harm, you know, in building your brand around, you know, different concepts. And in 2007, Kenya pioneered, you know, the mobile money services in this country. And, and we know that M-Pesa has not only revolutionized, you know, the way transactions are done here in Kenya, but the world over. But how comes, you know, the world doesn't know this story about mobile transactions? Well, I think in this particular case in M-Pesa, the intellectual property was not kept in Kenya. The intellectual property when I think the investors at that time in Safaricom was Vodafone. Mm. I think in the small print of that shareholders agreement, any technology or any innovation that this partnership will bring will be to the benefit of the partner involved. So I think we're very ignorant sometimes. And in ignorance, we don't realize that some of these innovations have serious value. And had we had an intellectual property and IP on M-Pesa, that whole uh, ecosystem today would be very different. The revenue that Kenya would have got is very different. Okay, fine, it, what happened, happened. And yes, M-Pesa is today global. It's not local. It's been introduced all over the world. But I think as Kenyans, we should be very, very proud that yes, maybe we didn't look at the small print on the IP of uh, uh, intellectual property on uh, M-Pesa, but surely it has revolutionized the world and people talk about it. And the Harvard Business School studies around M-Pesa and yes, the truth of the matter is I was talking to a, an audience in Washington and I said to them, our grandmothers in, uh, in Kenya are very, very intelligent because they can buy two kilos of potatoes on airtime and they could be sitting in a village which uh, you haven't visited for six months. And uh, so the, the interview guy was interviewing me. He said, so how can you call them more intelligent? I said, it's very simple. I don't think many grandmothers here in the U.S. can even do an SMS. <laughs> and we're transacting business. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a big divide in technology. We've just leapfrogged and we've gone into a new space. Whereas, and it's true, you ask somebody in the US, can you send me an SMS? It's, it's a project because they're so used to landlines. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a leapfrogging that Kenya has done. And yes, I think it's a great story, Ampesa, and we need to be proud of it. Mm -hmm. And it no, needs to be done. I mean, yeah. it needs to be, ta to be told, yeah. you know to the current generation and of course to the future generations. I mean, you know, look at geothermal for example and renewable energy. Yeah. And in Africa you do not talk about renewable energy without talking about the story of Kenya whereby almost 80% of uh, the energy generated in this country, you know, is from renewable sources. We're talking about geothermal, you know, which is in peak, I mean, it is in plenty. And we're also planning to form a narrative around our brand that's when you think about, you know, sustainable uh, um, energy models, Kenya is a place to go in Africa. No, I agree totally. That's exactly what our plan is, actually. We want to make sure that this sustainable energy, the whole world is going through a metamorphosis. And right now, as you can see, COVID has brought a new realization to everybody. The entire world is looking at reorganizing supply chains. We've all seen the disruption that COVID has done because of being so global. And uh, I think there's a new a uh, wave of, I call it glocalization, where global brands now want to m operate in a local environment. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer about globalization. I see that uh, sustainability is going to become a big agenda on the consumer's mind. And it's no longer going to be fast fashion or it's not going to be uh, you know, quick speed to market. 
the whole narrative of consumer pattern and consumption is going to change. And it's very simple to 9-11. 9-11 uh, uh, just changed the way we travel. Because when you go to an airport, you have to be checked outside, inside, three or four checks before you get into the plane. That's what 9-11 did to us. That became a way of life. That security checks are going to be four or five checks before you sit on your seat. Mm -hmm. And this, what we're going through right now with COVID, is also going to bring a new realization in terms of hygiene, in terms of consumer patterns, in terms of sustainability. And when it comes to that sustainability, and when it comes to that geothermal energy that we've got, 7,000 uh, megawatt, I mean, the largest reserves in the world. And if you imagine that the world is going to be talking about green energy as opposed to uh, the conventional energy, green energy will actually carry a consumer preference out there. So if this shirt is made using green energy, it will, it will just sell because the new generation, the millennials out there, all of them are wired differently. And they're actually not talking about price. They're talking about value propositions. So the older models used to be USPs. What is your unique selling proposition? Mm -hmm. well, that's what they taught us in school. But it's outdated. Today, the new model is what is your UVP? What is your value proposition? Your unique value proposition is why I should buy from you. And sustainability features right in the middle of that. People are seeing global warming. We are seeing what's happening. We're talking about the Paris Accord. And when you subscribe to such strong values in terms of energy, I think we have got a straight winner. And yes, as Kenya, we need to tap on it and we need to brand it. Mm -hmm. And all of our products need to say, this product is made using green energy. It will carry a different value proposition. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, uh, you know, in a country whereby, you know, of almost 40, I mean, 50 million people, and you have a situation whereby almost uh, 40, 46, 45 percent of the population, you know, live below 300 shillings, you know, on a daily basis. And whereby you have constant political bickerings, you know, among the, you know, political class. You know, how then do you sell this brand that we call Kenya, you know, to Kenyans themselves, you know, first of all, to the people in the remotest part of this country, you know, like in Karabatula, for example, you know, in the, in, in the island of Lamu, for example. H how do you make them own this brand? How do you make them feel proud about this brand? Well, I think it's, it's a question of the narrative. What is the narrative? Yes, we have a, uh, you talked about politics and that takes a lot of our newspaper space and I think Kenyans are so used to this reality show now that if it's not happening, they don't enjoy reading the paper as well. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is, I think with the new thinking of government and uh, with the way we are moving forward into the next uh, space of our administration, we're looking at a very different type of uh, mindset whereby I don't think we should be looking at politics driving economics. We are, the narrative is changing, it's economics driving politics and COVID is also teaching us that. That yes, for the last two months we've not had any rally, but life didn't stop. But life did hurt because people were not ha getting their daily bread on time or there were some, uh, somebody's lost a job or whatever it is. So that politics over economics narrative is very quickly moving on to economics over politics. And when that happens, your nationalism kicks in because your economy is driven by local production, local manufacturing, local uh, use, and local consumption. So I, I see it changing very fast, and mm -hmm. people will not even realize that, you know what, it's changed. It's no longer politics over economics. Mm -hmm. It's economics over politics. And before we wake up in the morning one fine day, that will be the new reality. That will be the new norm. We're already living a new norm. And I don't think life will ever be the same again because we've seen how we can function with or without uh, going out at night. Uh, the curfew is on for three months. That's been our new life. And we've seen a lot of family time where people would not have that because they were up and about. A lot of people are not traveling. And uh, so, you know what? There's a whole correction going on. It's a bit early to say what that correction will look like at the end of the day, mm -hmm. but surely this is a new normal that we are going into a new space, mm -hmm. and Kenyans also will go through that. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and this is a story that we have talked about, you know, for many years. I mean, if you want to do Kenya, you, you know, immediately after independence, you know, the, the government embarked on creating a new image, a new narrative, you know, for Kenya, you know, and, and, and the, there were three major issues that the government outlined that they wanted to deal with. And number one was uh, poverty levels. Number two was illiteracy. And number three, you know, the discussion around health. Well, 
Uh, one may argue that, you know, literacy, you know, levels, you know, are quite high here in Kenya. But we still struggle with the issue of poverty. And uh, we still struggle with the issue of uh, 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 poor health. Uh, how do we move forward, you know, without first of all addressing these and addressing them, you know, conclusively? Well, I think the first and foremost thing to do is we have a very high unemployment. We need to move that uh, unemployment into productive labor force. And for them to move from, from um, hopelessness into hopeful society is going to happen purely because you created jobs for them. So with this big four agenda, we're looking at manufacturing being a big stay, and we're looking at the other three pillars as well. So if we can grow our industry and we can grow the pie and we can employ our people, we'll actually start seeing a new, a new Kenya because the poverty levels are largely driven by joblessness. Mm -hmm. And that joblessness breeds hopelessness and hopelessness breeds uselessness and uselessness breeds then uh, crime and uh, all sorts of other issues. But nobody gets up in the morning to say, you know what, today I want to steal here or I want to do that. It's because that hunger pain is so intense that he's forced into a situation which he really doesn't want to do. So our ethics are very clear. That is not our DNA. Our DNA is to get up and work. And you see it when you move across the continent of Africa. You actually see a Kenyan worker and his productivity is so much higher. Yeah, because you need to work to eat. There are certain countries in the continent that you don't need to work to eat because you will just eat because they're very fertile and, and uh, there is no food insecurity. So I think the hard-working Kenyans uh, are only is a breed of the ecosystem, but that ecosystem has brought us to be very hard-working and anyway, in the, and on the continent, see how many Kenyans are working in this professional or that professional. And also in, in abroad, in Europe, US, they're top jobs with Kenyans. So yeah, as we expand the pie, as uh, we move into, this, for example, the Continental Free Trade Agreement, which was going to be launched on 1st of July, it's now delayed to 1st January, mm -hmm. but we're looking at the pie size getting bigger. As the pie size getting bigger means if industry can locate in Kenya and with the enabling environment that we're trying to create, they can sell into a bigger pie, we'll start s seeing that. So I think fundamentally we must address joblessness because that's where the problem is. That's where the problem is. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you were talking about, you know, the 9-11, you know, the bombings that took place in the, in the U.S. And immediately, you know, the president back then, you know, George Bush, you know, urged Americans, it is high time, you know, we stood together. It is high time we go out shopping in a big way. It is high time we go out, you know, and make barbecues, you know, and celebrate an authority so that we show the enemy that, yes, no, we were hurt, yeah. but we still remain strong. What is the message are we, tr are we planning to give Kenyans, you know, after coronavirus? Well, the message is strong and uh, it's a very simple message. We have hope. We're living hope. And Kenya is at the moment temporarily paused like the rest of the world. But that doesn't mean that very quickly we're going to... I'll give you an example, right? We have uh, $6 billion of exports from Kenya and we have about $16 billion of imports. Uh, from the rest of the world. The trade deficit is about 10 to $11 billion. And uh, what we are noticing in the domestic front right now is because of the disruption in supply chain, imports are slowing down. So our 2020 numbers, I uh, wouldn't be shocked if the imports have gone down by $2 billion or so. Right, they will have an impact on our exports as well. Our exports might also uh, shrink because our markets have uh, collapsed in the sense that uh, retailers are shut in, in Europe, US. But we should be looking at this as an opportunity, an opportunity that w what can we do with import substitution, which was a policy in the 70s and the 80s. And it is about time that we need, because we have lived with disruption of imports for the last three months, surely we can start thinking, and that's why I said the whole narrative of globalization, maybe globalization has peaked, and this is what Corona has taught us. And maybe Corona has also taught us that, guys, we need an in-country local solution. Because, for example, i give you an example of PPE. The uh, rest of the world, Europe included, uh, stopped to sell us PPE two months ago. They said, oh, we need it for other people. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So you guys, we've done a great business with you for the last 25 years. But you know what? Right now, our citizens come first. So you can die on your own. Mm -hmm. And we are not prepared to accept that. 
So we have developed in Kenya PPE made in Kenya for our an in-country local solution. So the point I'm making, there was a lot of innovation that has happened because of Corona. So we are now thinking that if we could have made it under an emergency, surely we can make it in normal conditions. So necessity is the mother of invention, and I'm very optimistic that a lot of imp import substitution will happen post Corona. A lot of supply chains will reorganize themselves. A lot of supply chains will actually exit China as well, and India, and they will start looking at Africa differently because up to now Africa was a selling ground. But with this disruption, those large factories out there have also had problems. So there will be investment moving into this part of the world and part of my job will be to make sure that we, we bring those investors on board and we create those jobs and we address that one agenda. And that one agenda, like I said, joblessness. So really speaking, uh, the only job that we all of us should be doing is jobs, jobs and jobs. If we can Creation create those jobs, jobs we are home. Mm -hmm. and, and still talking about you know, export, I mean, when you look at the, at the, at the, at the national exports development and promotion, uh, and promotion uh, strategy, uh, it talks about you know, growing our exports by an average of 25% you know, per annum. But when you look at how we're doing it, I mean, it, it's, it's barely growing. And we're losing our traditional exports market you know, in East Africa you know, to China. How then do we expect to achieve these, you know, at a time when, you know, the dominance of the Kenyan export market is being challenged by other countries like India and China? No, but that's what exactly I was saying earlier on, that India and China and Corona has actually taught us that relying on those value chains which are far and wide will, will not be the name of the game. The name mm -hmm. of the game is changing, and there's a lot of localization and regionalization. So, like I said earlier on, to me, globalization has peaked. To me, the new World Trade Order is out there. It's written. Mm -hmm. It's not WTO, it's not World Trade Organization anymore. Mm -hmm. It's the new World Trade Order. The new World Trade Order is a lot about protectionism, protecting your turf, protecting your jobs. We can see the social pressures the US is going through right now. It's because of joblessness. Mm. All those people who lost their jobs in three months, they have vented in a different manner. So, East Africa market, I don't think we are losing the East African market. I think we will rebound and will rebound bigger and better. So right now the industry in Kenya is already preparing for rebound and rebounds to a new space. And uh, I know that for a fact because I've been talking to the Kenya Association of Manufacturers and they're all very clear that how will we benefit from the rebound because the rebound is going to happen. And it's not time for us to sit back and say, oh my God, this is the end of the world. But it's time for us to say, yes, we are going to be living a new normal and how can we benefit and how can we expand our industry mm -hmm. and what can we do differently. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as we wind up, uh, we have been talking about, you know, the buy Kenya, you know, build Kenya uh, 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 strategy, you know, for more than 15 years now. How, how comes, you know, Kenyans are yet to buy, you know, the buy Kenya, build Kenya uh, uh, narrative? Well, I think you've heard of the saying called charity begins at home. Mm -hmm. And in that, you can actually see that uh, we had in the traditional past a lot of uh, goods that were being opened by, imported by government themselves. So you got to lead by example. Right now, if you see uh, the current uh, Buy Kenya, Build Kenya initiative, you have to procure locally. That's really a mandate. Mm -hmm. They give preference to local purchase, I think up to 15% on price. But even if you look at simple things like police uniforms, we used to import them and we have a whole textile industry which was limping for a long time. But at that time, I think the, the entrepreneurs felt that the right thing to do was to bring goods from China because they profit more. But I think government has put a foot down and said, no, we must buy local. And I thought you, you saw CS Matiangi say the other day, we will never buy police uniforms again from China or from India. So they are buying locally and we can see it. We can see it in the uh, Ministry of Health with the COVID, uh, with the, uh, the PPEs, they're buying local. So I think there's a strong message from government and when government starts buying, it creates confidence and government is the largest buyer in the world in any country. Mm -hmm. And once you lead by example, the rest will just follow because if you lead in a bad way, then of course uh, you have no confidence in your own economy and your own manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So I see that narrative changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Barry, I mean, between you and me, you, you're very optimistic and you're very enthusiastic, you know, about the brand Kenya. But how then do you sell 
these whole concepts, you know, to the politician out there in the street, to the government bureaucrats in their offices, you know, to the civil servants, so that at the end of the day, I mean, everyone pulls in the same direction. But that's exactly what's happening. There's now legislation out there that you can't buy. Uh, again, I go back to the uniforms. You can't buy uniforms imported anymore. Mm -hmm. And you, there is legislation out there that even furniture needs to be made in Kenya. So we are looking at it sectorially. For example, a classical example is the SGR. If you look at the SGR, right, the cement that was supposed to come from China for that project because they wanted grade 42 and Kenya was making only grade 32. So the contractor that was given that job I think China Bread and Road Construction Company, they, they had actually applied for duty-free cement for, to finish the SDR. But Kenya Sessional Manufacturers lobbied that, guys, you know, we want slice of pie. And it, it was mandated in the contract that 40% local content. And to, to meet that criteria of 40% local content, there was investment required. So what did the, well, the, the contractor said, I can't get this grade of cement, so what do I do? And the one I want is 42.5. And they reached out saying that uh, you guys don't make this. But when we deliberated internally, I think the first company was Bamburi and then uh, other company followed with a small investment, all of them ended up making a grade of cement that was required. So I think if you're given the opportunity, you will see this happening. And when you legislate some of these things, like right now all government contracts require 40% local content, mm -hmm. which is a start. And slowly, slowly we can move up the ladder. But that is how you create investment and how you create uh, jobs by actually making sure that there is a strong buy Kenya build Kenya policy. Jaswinder, thank you so very much indeed for your time. And you know, before I let you go, I mean, there's somebody who is watching this program and asking, I mean, this is likely to be a hard sell. What is your message for them? Well, I don't think there's going to be any hard sell. The truth of the matter is, you know, there's the proof in the pudding. And you can see the Kenyan industry has outshined the rest of the region by a mile. We are exporting, like I said, $6 billion. Yes, we might have a little bit of injury because of COVID, especially in the floriculture, horticulture sector, uh, and also in textiles and apparel to the US because most of the retailers have had big problems out there. But uh, the truth of the matter is that we have hardworking people. What are the five big drivers of any commodity or any business or any production facility. One is the bill of materials which we buy at world price, so we're not disadvantaged. The second one is the cost of infrastructure, which, uh, uh, which we are working on. You can see all the roads being built, you can see the rail. Third is the cost of utility, which we are working on in terms of water and electricity, productivity, cost of production, uh, that is happening. And, uh, and finance, we're looking at it, how can we, so if we have those parameters or those five drivers of any cost value chain and we are addressing each and every one of them I don't see that we will be left behind going forward because we as a country we need to address the one word of a core competitiveness as long as we know there is a problem mm -hmm. and you're working towards addressing your core competitiveness you're in business mm -hmm. otherwise you're toast and I don't think there's I can't I can't say that you've got to be world-class I must say that or you're no class. You cannot say, oh, but I'm in Africa. You Please can't sit me. on the fence. You can't sit on the fence. And I think as a Kenya, mm -hmm. as Kenya, we've taken a view, we're going to be world class. If we can be world class runners, why can't we world class producers? Very good. Thank you. Just window. Asante sana for Sante your time. Sana. Thank and you. Look forward to four more engagements. Asante. You see, the Clarion Core is very simple. Buy Kenya, build Kenya, and we must own this brand that we call Kenya because there's only one Kenya in the world. My name is O'Brien Kimani. You have been watching Inside Government. Thank you so much for your time. Good luck and good night.